morning, everyone. Um, <clears throat> that URL there, uh, if you go on, you will find my presentation and you can download it. Uh, if you're on Twitter feed, and right now about 10% of you are, the URL is up there. But also, you will find other slide sets, movies, and you will find written materials to support this presentation. Um, I'm going to move at quite a pace. I'm addressing a problem that is current in industry. It's one that's very troublesome. And in many respects, it's not one that we've got a direct answer for. So um, being a, a largely academic uh, audience, I'm, a, I'm even going to risk a mathematical formula. OK, so very different kind of approach. So let's start here. Uh, in the 1970s, I was a very young man. And I went to see the movie 2001, and I was really impressed with HAL 9000. And at the time, the futurists said, HAL 9000 will be with us in 30 years. So sure enough, 2000 came, and I checked with the futurists, and they said, HAL 9000 will be with us in 30 years. <laughs> and in 2010, they said, HAL 9000 will be with us in 30 years. And it's a bit disappointing. And you say, well, why uh, is HAL 9000 not here? We need him. We as a species are used to a linear, well-behaved world. We're used to dealing with two, three, four, no more than about seven variables at any one time. In the meantime, the world has gone nonlinear, much faster, and in business, we're dealing with 100 variables. And I think we can safely say that no one understands the economic and banking system of this planet. The complexity involved with HAL 9000 was not understood. I mean, in a big way. There was far more unknown than known. And I ask the question now, what do we know for sure? We know for sure that intelligence requires context and cognition and also some self-awareness. So I've only got time to give you one demonstration. Let us pray. Now, to you and I, the context of that phrase would indicate what I meant. To a machine without context, it has absolutely no idea whether I'm in the kitchen spraying a lettuce, whether I'm in church, or whether I'm in the garden. Fortunately, in the last 30 years, people have been working on creating contextual databases that are now big enough to make artificial intelligence work. But we do, know not, do not know what intelligence is. It's one of those words that we use, like life, and complexity, and scalability, and value, and thinking. You can look in the dictionary, but it, it doesn't give you a clue what it really means. And wordy descriptions like this are useless in the design and engineering context. And efforts by Alfred Binet with the IQ test, which is another useless parameter, don't help either. Uh, nor is the answer 42. So where is artificial intelligence? Here's an example. All those guys asked the wrong question. The question to ask is, how did Deep Blue win? The fact that it played a different kind of chess was the key. We do not need to build more human beings. Our procreation process is providing quite enough of those. Thank you very much. I'm interested in a new intelligence, new intelligences that are going to come about by machines, network machines, and more likely now, sensors on mobile phones, which are going to give us a different kind of intelligence and awareness. People get very upset. And this marked an epoch for me. In my life, I can remember the phrases, computers will never play chess. Computers will never play a good game of chess. Computers will never beat a grandmaster. You can now forget about chess.
we're at the back of the pack. That's where we use AI. But this is also where we use AI for modeling the unthinkable, modeling pandemics. But better still, what do you do when you've got a pandemic? How do you recover? What are the steps that you should take? By and large, human, t human beings and politicians in particular are ill-equipped to answer that question. So, you'll find AI on production lines. Uh, it now runs a mobile network. It's in the cockpit of aircraft. But it's also controlling trains, engines, elevators, and logistic chain. It's actually all over the place. And it's gradually taking over those complex and mundane things that you and I really do not want to do. So let's just see if we can answer the question a little further. And then I'm going to challenge the uh, thinking here by posing what relative intelligence is. But what the heck is it? We don't know. Um, TV game shows. We actually celebrate people who can answer questions, like, what's your name, at one end of the spectrum, and explain quantum mechanics at the other. But we can get machines to do that. And let me show you a machine that's doing it, actually far better than a human being. You notice that human beings didn't get a look in there. Now listen to this. kind of interesting, isn't it? We've now got competition between man and machine in terms of making life and death decisions. When I look back in my life, I went to school with kids like this. They could remember everything. And when it came to turning the handle on education problems, they were terrific. They got through all their exams like a breeze. It was great. But you know what? All the really smart people I ever met were educational failures. I mean real educational failures. There is a subtle difference between just knowing a process, being thrown a problem of a, diff of a classification, and being able to turn the handle and get the result, and an entirely different process to actually inventing something new, in actually looking at the problem differently. So. I'm now going to challenge you with a mathematical formula in a second, but I'm going to say to you that intelligence demands huge amounts of data, lots of context, cognition, but it needs a sensory system. So according to my analysis, here is comparative intelligence. And what it says is that intelligence is a function of actuators, mouth, hands, 
of sensors, the, the ears, the, the, the fingertips, uh, the tongue, and also processing power and memory. Evidence. It's possible to have intelligence without any processing power and without any memory. Slime mold has no processing power and no memory. It crawls across the forest floor, finds some food, consumes it. Jellyfish, single-celled cluster of society with no memory, no central processor. But what I can tell you for sure, and what's shown in this formula, is that if you have no sensory capability or no actuator capability, then you have no intelligence. Just to put it in context, the relative intelligence of machines, which is where this formula came from as an answer to an industrial problem, looks like that. So here's a bit of evidence. You get patients who have been comatose in a vegetative state for a decade. You slide them into an MRI machine and you whisper in their ear, I want you to think about playing tennis. The shocking answer is that according to 60, uh, the MRI scanner, 60% of these people can hear and can sense the world about them. They've been entombed in a human body for a decade. That's a heck of a horror story. But what it says is that this vegetative person who we would ascribe no intelligence, they are brain dead, they're not. They are alive. So I would put it to you that my pen may be listening to this presentation, it may be watching this presentation, but I don't know that because it has no means of communication. It's a dumb entity. And a lot of dumb entities are turning out to be rather smart. This is sort of key now to the whole way of thinking. Now, one engineering principle I learned a long time ago, and that is just because we don't understand something doesn't mean to say we can't use it. We were killing each other very well for thousands of years using bows and arrows without knowing anything uh, about uh, the mechanics of the process and ballistics. So where is AI in design? If you've got a mobile phone or a laptop with you or a pad, the chances are that the chips were designed using AI. So the machine was designing the machine. I used to design chips, and we used to do it on our hands and knees on huge sheets of paper covering the floor. And I was involved in getting to the CAD CAM stage, but then the CAD CAM stage got too complicated for us, and AI moved in. But it's also in the design of things like oil rigs, refineries, that are far too complex for human beings to actually cope with. The wiring systems and the electronics in aircraft fighting machines, and some domestic machines also has AI. This is the fastest aircraft in the world. It just crashed into the sea on a trial. But it's a Mach 20 aircraft designed by DARPA in the US. And this is an antenna, believe it or not. Are there any antenna designers in the audience? No, OK, well, uh, let me tell you that only an antenna engineer could find that beautiful. Uh, it is beautiful. Um, but human beings can't design antennas like that. It's more efficient than anything we've seen before. An AI program did it. Whoops. Space environments. Habitat design is now done by AI. And so, it's in the design of data systems, it's in the design of search engines, and it's everywhere. And we do need it. If I go on to Google, and Google is a brilliant and useless device at the same time, and I say, search artificial in intelligence, I'll get 96 million search results in 10 milliseconds, and here are the first 10. That doesn't help me a lot. I would like my machine to understand what I'm working on. I'd like it to think about what I need, and I'd like it to find appropriate stuff, please. But a lot of this is a combination of artificial intelligence and artificial life, and a lot of it is evolutionary. It's a little step on. 
So the question I now want to pose is, is AI ever really creative in the human sense? Well, actually, yes, because every single one of these inventions up to the year 2001, when this survey was completed by Scientific American, has been eclipsed by AI and bettered. I used to be an electronic circuit de uh, designer when my youth. We now have electronic circuits that are designed by AI that we do not understand. And the reason is our mathematical ability runs out at about five feedback loops. And some of the circuitry has tens or hundreds of feedback loops. And we cannot cope with that. But here is something from a machine mind that I think is truly astounding. NASA set the program, the task, or the intelligence, the task, of designing a planetary walker. This has come from nothing in the past. This is not an evolutionary step. This is a new kind of thinking about the problem. Nothing like this has been seen before. Human beings are now trying to make these because they can do things that wheels and tracks and legs can't do. And when you dispatch something to a far off planet, it needs a degree of autonomy that the vehicles that we currently have do not afford. Sorry. Hollywood's done a great job of scaring the pants off the general population, and if you start talking to them and tell them that you're working on artificial life or artificial intelligence, that's what they think about. And uh, perhaps quite rightly too. But so far, it's really not been like that. This is where we now have and we see AI as an essential tool. In robotics, cybernetics, complex systems, but what's coming intrigues me. What intrigues me is the intersection of nano, bio, and IT, the second industrial revolution, our savior in this world of resources that are becoming scarce, lies in that area. If I was to start my career again, that's where I would be. Understanding genetics is proving very difficult. Understanding proteomics is massively difficult and certainly beyond us. And that nano bio systems is going to need AI to help us to get our minds around what the possibilities are. So, ladies and gentlemen, my summing up of where we are, our future will only accelerate with the help of AI. I'll leave that URL up there for any of you that want to copy it down. Please feel to take anything you want from my website and use it as you see fit. Thank you very much indeed. Well, 